So today I'm going to try to convince you um, that London Tunic RNA that's makes Switzerland. Switzerland. Oh, that's, that's Lausanne, by the way, yes. <coughs> that's, so this is a French Alp, and this is the, the old town with the university, the first university building uh, that was uh, established in 14 something. Okay. So um, the idea is to <coughs> discuss a little bit London coding RNA as therapeutic targets <coughs> in cardiac disease, right? So I have a few slides of introductions if you're not familiar with cardiac disease. So I'll make it very simple. We're interested uh, in myocardial infarction. So after an infarction, you have approximately 25% of the, of the ventricle that die, right? The muscle die. So it's approximately a billion cardiomyocytes that die after infarction. And they never replace. They are never replaced because the heart doesn't possess regenerative potential. So um, you have proliferation of fibroblasts instead. <coughs> and this fibroblast will produce a matrix and eventually a fibrotic scar, which is itself detrimental. So this heart will show a transition to heart failure. So the whole idea is to try to, uh, to change this, and uh, we're trying to uh, target coding genes, but also non-coding genes, in order to promote a more regenerative type of, uh, of repair. And for this, we're using different tools and genome and epigenome editing. So there's different cells that you can target in order to uh, improve cardiac function after infarction. So the idea is to produce more cardiomyocyte <laughs> and to decrease the activity of the fibroblast, right? So uh, in order to do this, you can target the cardiomyocyte and trying to change their behavior and make them more proliferative. So these are terminally differentiated cells that do not proliferate. Uh, uh, approximately uh, one week after birth. So you can try to, uh, re -enter, to uh, induce a re-entry in the cell cycle in, the, in these cells and make them proliferate in order to produce more carbon myocyte. Now, obviously, if you target the fibroblast, then uh, you want to de-differentiate them after they have been differentiated into myofibroblasts that produce the matrix. You can, if you uh, think about cell therapy for heart disease, then you can use different type of precursor, or stem cell, embryonic stem cells, induced protein stem cell, or cardiac precursor, and try to induce them to differentiate into cardiomyocytes. And this is more uh, the future. When you try to reprogram the somatic cells, for instance, the fibroblast, into a cardiomyocyte, direct reprogramming. So just evidence that it works. Right? We have also projects in this uh, in this area. <coughs> so everything will will end up with more uh, carbon myocyte, hopefully, and less fibroblast, and then you improve function. Okay, so this for the, the the context. So let me tell you a little bit about the London coding RNA. Uh, you will have probably uh, more about it uh, tomorrow, but I have a few. Uh, introduction uh, for, for this, uh, this molecules. The first thing I want to mention is that if you look at different uh, species and you rank them based on complexity right, of the organism, you have here the vertebrae, you see that you have a correlation between complexity and the amount of non-coding genome. So if you have complex organisms, you have a lot of the non-coding gene. And this culminates uh, in humans where you find 98% uh, of the genome is non-coding. <laughs> now, it doesn't mean that uh, it's because it's non-coding that it's not active. So, 80% of the non-coding genome is transcribed into some kind of molecule. Uh, and so we differentiate between the small non-coding RNAs, uh, microRNA, the RNA you have the list here, and the, the long non-coding RNA. So this is very heterogeneous, 
and very difficult to study, as you will see. But you, so you have to find a function uh, on a case by case basis. Um, and uh, this, is, this is basically uh, our work to find non encoding RNA that are relevant in cardiac disease. Now, I just mentioned this as an yeah, arbitrary cutoff size uh, between small and non encoding RNA, and this is 200 nucleotide in size. So, this is completely arbitrary, nothing to do with function. Now, the function that has been associated to non encoding RNA comes from different fields of science. But basically, uh, they can uh, partner with protein and send signal to send, for instance, chromatin modifiers to particular location in the genome. So they can act as signal, guide, or scaffold, which is pretty much the same. Uh, and they modify the epi local epigenome in order to promote uh, uh, gene, trans gene uh, transcription or repress gene transcription. Right? So they modulate gene expression. They can act as decoy for uh, protein, for the splicing uh, factor, transcription factors, but also for microRNA. And a, a very important group as is associated with enhancer sequence. So enhancer uh, are transcribed, and uh, this molecule are sort of a, a promoting the looping between the enhancer and the promoter of the adjacent coding genes in order to promote expression and also in the stabilization of this group. So let me, let me uh, just expand a little bit about enhancer RNA because th this is uh, kind of important. So how they uh, function uh, is, uh, I mean, there's still a lot of debate about it. But there's basically three different models. Now, some people think that, uh, well, the non encoding RNA is just a byproduct of the, the activity of the, the enhancer. So you have uh, this loop that forms between the enhancer and the promoter. The transcription machinery will be loaded at this location. And then the gene is expressed. And at the same time, you have the non encoding RNA that are produced, but there's no real function for the mature transcription. Now, there's a, 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 another model in which the London coding RNA promotes the loading of the machinery. So there's a function in promoting gene expression by uh, favoring this, this uh, uh, formation of this complex. And this is a more complex model in which the mature transcript is uh, important both uh, because it has cis function and trans function. So the, the RNA is important for the looping, the, the, the stabilization of the loop between the enhancer and the promoter. It promotes gene expression in cells, but can also, uh, in a kind of same mechanism, promote the association with a gene in a different promoter. So that would be basically the same mechanism, but a kind of a pseudo trans effect, right? But the, the RNA can also be released from uh, its site of transcription and travel to associate with protein partner and have different function in the nucleus, uh, but also in the cytoplasm, as we will see. So that would be real trans function, the mature RNA that travels and uh, promote the function uh, a, a long way uh, down. Now, uh, I already mentioned this because uh, we're mostly interested in polyadenylate, multi organic non encoding RNA. Uh, we think they are more relevant because they are more stable. And uh, the one that are associated with enhancer would form a particular group of enhancer non encoding RNA. And we think that these molecules are particularly important for promoting both cis and trans function. So they are kind of coordinate a response, such as a response to stress, for instance. Now, just a, a, a quick word about enhancer. So the typical enhancer are marked by different uh, chromatin marks, for instance, H3K27 acetylation. 
they are bound by transcription factor, they are also associate with different type of protein, uh, RNA polymerase 2. But uh, there's a different type of uh, enhancer that we call super enhancer. And they're particularly rich in, uh, in uh, chromatin mark, transcription factor, and other protein. Now, these ones are particularly important in controlling gene expression in cysts. So the dynamic of, ex of uh, activation of the, the, the adjacent genes, of the cognate genes, is, uh, is, more, uh, is more important when this enhancer is active. Now, we recognize a super enhancer using an algorithm. So the idea is to rank this enhancer based on occupancy, for instance, this particular mark. And if you do this, you can create this hockey stick, a uh, hockey stick, sorry, uh, curve. And uh, if you have a point in which the slope is equal to one, and just by definition, we call the one that are on the right hand side super enhancer, a particular region from the team. And the other one would be a typical enhancer. And there's evidence that super enhancers are particularly important for cell-specific processes, such as control of identity and behavior. Now, they're also important for disease. So in this particular study, uh, this has been established. So they also looked at SNPs that are associated with disease in a GWAS study. In GWAS study. Now, they, they, they found 93% of the SNPs that fall into the non-coding genome. So that's not too surprising because yeah, it's, that's 98% 90, of non-coding. So this part is more important. If you look at the uh, super enhancer uh, that are recognized in this study, they looked at super enhancer that are active in the tissue of interest, let's say the brain, they more likely uh, uh, to contain SNPs that are associated to brain disease. For instance, Alzheimer's disease. And this is also true for the heart. Right? If you have a super enhancer uh, that is active in the heart, you're more likely to contain a SNPs that is associated to a cardiac disease. So this, this is uh, really establishing the importance of super enhancer in disease in general. And just uh, one word about um, uh, also uh, long encoding RNA and the organization of the, of the genome. So this is a model proposed by John Rin. Uh, the idea is that uh, long encoding RNA are important because they, when they are transcribed, they, they uh, favor a repositioning of the DNA, of the chromatin, in, and the 3D organization is then different, and then we promote a biological process or particular developmental uh, uh, process. So they, they, they call it the cat scrabble model. So you can imagine that you have a string that is uh, pulled by a person, and another person comes and try to pull this, this uh, string in a different conformation, right? Uh, so this would be the idea of a, a protein that would recognize the site of transcription and then try to uh, promote a different conformation and then a different type of response in this cell. Okay, so long linking RNA and the cardiovascular uh, work. This is just to show you that there's many link RNA that have been identified uh, in different contexts and different uh, developmental contexts, uh, but also uh, in differentiated cells. This is expanding. Every day you have another one. So I just mentioned maybe the historical one here. Uh, we have contributed to, to a few of them. Mm -hmm. I will talk about Meteor today. We have described Carmen, Novel in 6, Whisper also. I, I described Whisper also today. But I mean, there, there are many now. And uh, at every step of this, um, of, the, of the development, uh, or uh, during the response to stress, you can find link RNA that, uh, that have definitely functioned. Right? 
So um, I will uh, now address um, this particular uh, uh, biological process and try to convince you that you, you can target the fibroblast uh, and try to promote some beneficial effect for our plant. So we had uh, originally this uh, study uh, that was published a couple of years ago when we uh, isolate the border zone of the infarct, uh, it is the mouse model, and we perform uh, very deep RNA sequencing, three to four hundred million reads per sample. That allows to reconstruct the transcriptome. So we have this new assembly, and using this, we identify novel uh, long and cunning RNA, meaning previously unannotated ones at the time we published the study. Uh, you see, it's 1,500, so this is a, a substantial number. Then you can characterize these uh, different ways, for instance, uh, looking at heart, uh, heart enrichment, uh, correlation with different uh, physiological parameters, uh, association with chromatin, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, enhancer. Um, and uh, we uh, also found that most of them have a predictive uh, human autologs, which is very important uh, in terms of conservation and function. Now, uh, this is just to emphasize the, the importance of performing very deep sequencing, analysis, uh, very deep sequencing, when you want to discover a novel gene. It's not as important when you have the, the novel assembly because you can use it with more shallow sequencing. But this is important because uh, this is basically what we would have missed if we would have used only 15 million reads per sample. Right? So uh, many, many uh, non-open would escape our annotation. Uh, you can uh, question the relevance of the one that I've discovered. It's very deep sequencing because they are maybe lowly expressed, but it's a different issue. Right? Uh, for, for having a, a, a very precise annotation, you need this sequencing. So what can you do with this? You can uh, first um, we, we try to uh, evaluate whether these molecules were uh, cell specific or tissue specific. There's evidence that it is the case for long long term. This is one example of a novel link. Uh, this is novel link six, by the way. Uh, so this one is expressed only in the heart as compared to other tissue. But if you analyze this more globally. You can compare the expression in the heart, or in the sample we used in the analysis, with 17 non-cardiac tissue. Where every time you have this one of these red dots here, it means that the link RNA is heart enriched. So this is for messenger RNA. So you see a few of them. This was the previously annotated one. So we have more, and this is the novel one. You see that uh, um, a lot of this long encoding RNA are specifically expressed in the heart. And if you look at the differentially ex uh, expressed transcript, almost 60% of those that are cardiac specific or cardiac language. So they, they make an uh, extremely interesting molecule for targeting now uh, uh, function in biological function or biological process in, in the heart. This is a different type of analysis. Now we correlate the expression of the link globally with parameters that define cardiac dimension and function. So the heart remodel after infarction, so the size of the ventricle will increase, the diameter would increase, etc., uh, etc. Et so what we found that uh, in this unsupervised clustering, we can define four different clusters. And this cluster, for instance, cluster four, is particularly associated to cardiac function, but not to parameters that define uh, cardiac dimension. This is different for cluster two, when we have the, the exact reverse picture. This, this cluster two is more associated to cardiac dimension, but not function. So now you can differentiate different processes that are usually linked uh, when you analyze cardiac disease. 
and uh, uh, maybe define markers uh, for understanding the remodeling process, but also for predicting the outcome of the disease. Um, so if you look at the specific parameters, for this is called uh, ejection fraction, so this is function, so this is absolute correlation. So single parameters, you see that you see the you plus the two and plus the four are uh, correlated with these parameters. This is also true for the, the size of the infarct. But if you look, for instance, at the thickness of the septum, right, one parameters, you see now that plus the one is also correlated with, uh, with these particular parameters. Meaning that in cluster one, you have a link that uh, is sensitive, or a couple of links, or more links, that are sensitive to the, the increase inside <coughs> of the septum. Showing you the, the exquisite sensitivity of this molecule to a particular response in the heart. Now, finally, we, we looked at um, whether this link were associated with an enhancer. So, I mean, we looked at different marks. But, uh, so, this is a, a typical example where when you have the association only in the heart with the H3K27 acetylation, showing that uh, this link is transcribed from an enhancer. So, if you look at globally again, I mean, you can focus only on active enhancer, so the purple box here. What you see is that the novel link RNA are more associated to enhancer in every tissue, but particularly in the heart. So we have identified molecules that are enhancer associated and cardiac specific at the same time. Okay, so what can we do with this? So we, we select um, I mean, we had a pipeline for selection of this uh, long one coding RNA. We first use, I mean, we first select because they were anti an, um, intergenic. And it's just to simplify the, the, the situation because we have so many. Uh, if you have a link that overlaps the coding gene, it makes <coughs> a terrible situation to study the, the function of this link. So we select the intergenic ones. Then we select the one with an autologue in human and the ones that are associated with enhancers. And we discriminate typical enhancer and super enhancer. And among the differentially expressed ones, the most differentially expressed was associated to a super enhancer, this particular x lock Now, an interesting uh, feature of this, this London coding RNA, it is it is enriched in cardiac fibroblasts as compared to carbamyosin. So these are, uh, these are different links, Su the super enhancer associated one. Uh, you see that uh, you have a cardiac fibroblast marker, carbamyosin marker, but this one is mostly expressed in car cardiac fibroblast. So it is located in the locus containing also WISP2. This is the coding gene. Uh, that has been implicated in cardiac fibrosis. Now, as you will see, we don't think that this link functions through uh, modulation of this gene, but I, I'll come back to that. But because it was in the WISP2 locus, we called this one whisper for WISP2 super enhancer associated RNA. Now, having found um, a, a gene that is specifically expressed in cardiac fibers, very important. When, when, during the progression of the disease, you have interstitial fibrosis that takes place. And as I mentioned, this is detrimental uh, to heart function. Now, all current therapies are not specifically targeting the fibroblast. This is, they have indirect effect on the fibroblast physiology, but they do not target uh, the cardiac fibroblast. So we, we are in need of such a therapy. Now, studying the, the expression of whisper, yeah, it is enriched in the heart, as I mentioned, which is not the case for WISP2, by the way. But we found that uh, whisper, on top of that, is enriched in cardiac fibroblasts. This is the source of the fibroblast, as compared to fibroblasts coming from other tissue. 
So this is, uh, this is uh, again, extremely interesting. The, the link RNA is also expressed both in the cytoplasm and nucleus, suggesting that it might have transfunction. So it is expressed after infarction in fibroblasts. This is the, the kinetics of the expression. And it's expressed at the time point after infarction when you have myofibroblast differentiation and proliferation. To, to study a little bit further this uh, specificity, we performed this experiment. We used this model, the one kidney, one kid model. This is a renal vascular hypertension model. So you place a clip here on the renal artery, you decrease perfusion downstream, you create a, a volume overload, and that increases the pressure in the heart, and the heart adapts by a hypertrophy and cardiac fibrosis. So this is what is described here. You have this increase in mass. You have these are markers of stress in the heart. If you look at the uh, marker of fibrosis, uh, you see that it is there, they, uh, they are uh, induced in, in the heart, but also in the kidney, right? because the kidney becomes fibrotic. However, uh, whisper is only induced in the heart and not in the fibrotic kidney. So th this is impressive, because this is the first marker uh, we, we, we know of that type. And WIS2, WIS2 by the way, uh, is not uh, responding the same way. So we can target uh, the long non-cloning RNA using, for instance, uh, uh, modified antisense or oligonucleotide, a gap uh, to downregulate the expression of the, uh, the link. Uh, so if you do so in, my, in a myofibroblast, well, you will decrease the response, so you basically inhibit the differentiation into myofibroblast. You decrease proliferation, you decrease migration, and you induce apoptosis. Everything you need in order to make a therapy. So if you analyze this globally, basically that's confirmed uh, in terms of genes that are modulated, <coughs> uh, the geo terms are relevant, you have pro-apoptotic genes that are up, the uh, anti-apoptotic that are down, uh, etc. You have the cell cycle that is modulated accordingly, the pro-inflammatory molecules that are down, and the matrix molecules that are down. So is WISPR responsible for inducing the, the fibroblast uh, gene program in, in fibroblast? To test this, we use this approach that has been described by the Zhang Laboratory. So it's a CRISPR on approach. We're using, uh, um, uh, we express a fusion protein, the dead Cas9, fused to ZT64, uh, an activator of transcription. And we also express this fusion protein composed of MS2, it's the viral protein, and two co-activators, P65 and HSF1. And the guide RNA we use contain MS2 aptamer. So all together, we target this complex, very uh, uh, active complex, to the promoter uh, of a gene. In, in this case, whisper. That is, in this case, the upstream sequence uh, as determined by the TSS, right, the transcription start site. We activate whisper and in turn, we activate the cardiac, gene, uh, the, um, the cardiac fibroblast program. So this is the formal proof that WISPR is upstream, the, the cardiac fibroblast uh, gene program. And WISPR is not active. So WISPR, we, we don't think it is important in this type of response, because if we use GAPMER against WISPR, we don't have, uh, we don't mimic the effect of whisper down regulation. So basically, uh, we can probably uh, remove whisper from the equation. So, what are the mechanisms associated to whisper? Well, we have uh, used uh, RNA pull down in order to find the protein partners that are, uh, that are uh, associated to whisper. So, we have used a biotinylate whisper and the uh, uh, lysate <coughs> coming from the cardiac fibroblast to fish the protein that are uh, associated with whisper. And we coupled this with uh, mass spectrometry. 
we have identified a few proteins, but uh, this one was particularly interesting. First of all, it was confirmed uh, different ways. So TR is, a, uh, is our candidate. So uh, we use Western blotting in this case in order to confirm the association with Whisper, not with Antisense Whisper. Uh, and uh, we select this one also because it has important function. First of all, TR uh, is a multifunctional protein that has been shown to control the fibrogram gene program in different, different contexts. It controls uh, also proliferation, apoptosis, it can be associated to the long encoding RNA, and control the nuclear cytoplasmic shuttling of, of transcript. It is also important because it's a, a, a splicing factor. So it regulates splicing and the inclusion, in particular, of an extra exon in this lysine hydroxylase 2 uh, uh, transcript that favor the, the production of the long isoform of this uh, gene. And the long isoform has been shown to be important for collagen cross-linking. So you have two ways of controlling type tissue fibrosis now, by controlling the, the gene program and by controlling cross-linking of the matrix. Now, uh, these are a control experiment. So we use here uh, RNA immunoprecipitin assay uh, against TR to see whether we can or also uh, IP whisper. So you see that uh, uh, we do have uh, association TR whisper. With, uh, TR also associated with LH2, the, the hydroxylase, but not with WISP2, and in turn promote uh, the expression of uh, a long isoform of this particular gene. Now, if you treat the, the cells with a whisper gapmer, you abolish this, obviously. And if you use the gapmer uh, in vitro in cardiac fibroblast, what you see is that the nuclear retention of uh, TR is abolished. Uh, this is upon whisper knockdown. So can we use this um, with um, uh, in vivo? Yes, so, I mean, we can administer uh, uh, gap mers to the mouse after infarction. So you downregulate whisper in vivo. In terms, you downregulate all the fibroblast gene program. These are cardiac marker of stress, so they are also uh, uh, diminished, suggesting that the stress, uh, I mean, the stress is, uh, is reduced. And if you look at the remodeling, you see that the cardiac mass decreases and the fibrosis also decrease. And in terms, you improve function. So this is shown here by echocardiography. Function is increased while, uh, again, uh, infarct size is decreased and the ventricular diameter is decreased. So basically, you have uh, a better, a better uh, uh, outcome for this, this animal. Now, Whisper has a, a human orthodox, so uh, briefly, I mean, we have confirmed that in our tick stenosis patient. The, so this is the college. Uh, we have two groups here, one with uh, non-severe fibrosis, the other one with severe fibrosis. Um, and, and Whisper uh, correlates, uh, expression correlates with uh, collagen uh, volume fraction. And if you look uh, in vitro, you isolate human cardiac fibroblast, you will see that Whisper is expressed uh, when they differentiate, but it's not the case for human dermophilograph protein. So everything needs, uh, it seems to be, uh, to be um, uh, conserved, and also if you uh, can't regulate whisper in these cells and also uh, modulate the, the fibroblasting program, suggesting that everything is conserved again. Right. Okay, so I'm finishing this first part um, uh, by uh, a summary. Um, oh, by the way, this was the cover story. The, the, they said that uh, whispering, uh, with whispering secret about cardiac mm -hmm. fibroblast, I thought it was kind of nice. <laughs> so, um, so uh, I hope I had convinced you so far that long encoding RNA represents interesting targets. Uh, I'm not going to go, to, I'm not going through all of this, but I think whisper is, is a fantastic tool uh, in order to now go in vivo, uh, hopefully in patients one time. Uh, since uh, everything is conserved again, uh, in order to modulate 
the response of the two infarctions. And uh, I'd like to mention that everything was performed in the window of time that is clinically relevant because we are injecting the gap mirror, I don't know if you noticed, but after infarction, like two, three days after infarction, suggesting that it is uh, uh, feasible to use it in humans. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to switch here for the, for the rest of the talk and tell you a little bit about a different link that uh, uh, modulates the differentiation of ramionic stem cells into cardiomyocytes. So before, uh, before that, I want to give you a little bit of introduction <coughs> about the, the differentiation of, uh, of, uh, of uh, cardiomyocyte and the formation of the heart. So it's not a course on heart, on heart development, very briefly, the heart originates from this cartagenic mesoderm here that uh, is anterior in the, uh, in the embryo that will eventually form this, uh, this tube and the primary cardiac tube that will experience looping and ballooning for the, during the, the formation of the four chamber heart. Okay, so this is, this is not relevant for the talk. What is relevant is the, the origin of this cartagenic mesoderm here. And during gastrulation at the epiblast stage, you have this uh, internalization of, of the cells that will form a first um, uh, cellular intermediate, the uh, mesenderm. And the mesenderm will give rise to the mesoderm and the definitive endoderm. So we were interested in these particular cells because these are the very first step of differentiation that will uh, eventually form the heart. So if you look at the, um, uh, at the cellular level, this is a different view, right? This is the embryo now, it's the longitudinal section. Uh, you have the, the primary streak here and the formation of the mesenderm, what are the red cells, uh, not the pink cells, but the red cells between them. At the cellular level, the, again, the mesenderm here will produce the definitive endoderm and the mesoderm, and obviously this one will produce a, a, pro, a differentiated progeny, particularly cardiomyosin, which is the muscle and angioblast, and then from here, the, the endocellular cells and the uh, hematopoietic uh, uh, lineage. Now you can mark this different uh, stage by markers such as uh, aomesodermine, eomes, uh, then brachyuri, T, uh, MES1, which is the direct target of eomes, and then uh, cardiac transcription factors such as NKX 2.5, GATA4, and sarcomeric protein. And we can recapitulate this in vitro using this hanging drop model. So we just culture the embryonic stem cells uh, in drop, form this aggregate that will differentiate into cardiomyocyte, and uh, the, the steps are conserved. <coughs> Um, EOMES, uh, as I mentioned, is immediately upstream uh, uh, MES1, which is a master regulator of cardiac differentiation. This is uh, uh, from a uh, study by Costello et al. Uh, so if you compare uh, wild type and uh, EOMES mutants, you see that MES1 uh, is not expressed in the mutants. If you uh, use EOMES uh, uh, deficient cells, ES cells, you cannot differentiate the cells into carbomyocyte. And the difference between the, the mesoderm and the definite endoderm is the amount of nodal signal that they receive uh, uh, in order to differentiate. Okay, so <clears throat> we use this uh, particular uh, cell line that uh, uh, is a reporter cell line that contains a GFP here uh, uh, under control of the OMS promoter. So you can differentiate the cells, they will express GFP <coughs> after three days. Uh, the number of cells you can uh, detect, uh, the kinetics. Um, but you see that uh, uh, everything else is conserved. So you have EOMS expression, uh, brachy, and so on, the, the cardiac transcription factor that are activated in sequence, uh, uh, sequentially. And then the sarcomeric protein. And eventually you, you get uh, beating carbamyosin. Now, what we did is that uh, we used this system and isolate uh, either undifferentiated ER cells or the mesenderm cells by uh, fax after three days isolating the EOMS positive cells and compare this to the EOMS next cells and perform again a very deep sequencing transcriptome analysis and identify about 4,000 different novel long encoding RNA. 
So at the protein coding gene levels, I mean, we have appropriate regulation, uh, I mean, appropriate expression in these different cell types. In EMS plus, you have the mesonderm uh, genes and the cardiac mesonderm genes that are activated. And now if you look at the uh, long encoding RNA and looked at the geo terms that are associated to the adjacent gene, so for each link, we look at the adjacent gene and form a geo analysis. You see that you have, uh, in this particular uh, group, uh, very relevant uh, terms, right, in particular heart process. <coughs> now, in parallel, what we did is uh, we purified the cells and perform a chip seek analysis in order to identify uh, promoter and enhancer link. So, uh, again, we used the, the growth algorithms in order to identify a typical and super enhancer. And then, uh, uh, in the first information here is that you have the expected restriction in uh, enhancer usage during differentiation. And again, you know, the ones that are uh, active uh, specifically in EMS plus cells are particularly relevant because they are uh, associated to genes that are uh, important factor, transcription factor that induce the differentiation to the mesanderm. Now we have only six uh, 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 super enhancer in this group, so we weren't able to, to perform a geo. So we can now combine the two. So we looked at the link that are, have a promoter type of signature. Uh, in our, uh, our hand, the in our hand is, is uh, uh, associated to HCK4 <coughs> trimethylation or an enhancer signature, HCK27 acetylation. And these are all the, the, the link RNA, the novels and the previously annotated one. What emerged is that novel ones are more associated to enhanced sequence than the, the previously annotated ones that were previously annotated or the tissue, so they're not tissue specific. And this is what is shown here. If you look at the restriction in the different groups, you see that the, the enhancer associated link RNA they, they, show, they demonstrate um, more pronounced restriction during differentiation. And this is formally demonstrated here. So this is the normalized difference in expression. This is the specificity. And this is density plot shows that the two groups of enhancer link RNA are more self-specific than the promoter uh, associated. Now, we select a few of them and um, I'd like to, to uh, uh, show you these this three in particular because first, uh, they are associated to important transcription factors, in particular EOMS, but SOX-617 and USCOID are very relevant. I'm going to discuss only this one. Now, but all these three show a very important feature. First of all, they were uh, on the same topologically associating domain in the, in the, in the genome suggesting that they are co-regulated with uh, the adjacent gene. But also, the pattern of expression was kind of uh, important. As you can expect, these three transcription factors are more expressed in the EOMS plus than in the undifferentiated ES. But this is exactly uh, the, diff uh, uh, the reverse situation for the three London tuning RNA associated to them. They are highly expressed in ES cells, but downregulate in the, the differentiated cells. Now, we studied this different ways. First of all, we performed the deletion using CRISPR-Cas9 uh, in the, uh, so I'm sorry, I'm talking about the EOMS associated one now only. So we performed the CRISPR-Cas9 here in this, uh, this particular link to abolish its expression in ES cells. And differentiate the cell again, a uh, similar way uh, we're doing the hanging drop model. What you see is that the differentiation is completely abolished here. So we named this, uh, this uh, transcript Meteor for mesoderm transcriptional enhancer organizing region, link RNA. How long do you have? Do you have uh, two five minutes? Two minutes? Okay. <laughs> Okay, I'll try to speed up. What we, what we observed 
comparing the wild type ES with the knockout ES cells in terms of gene expression is that uh, globally you have a down regulation of the mesendodermal gene, but also an up regulation <coughs> of the neuroectodermal gene. So you have a switch in, uh, in the commitment of the cells now. This is formally de demonstrated here using a neurogenic differentiation protocol. And basically, you obtain more neurons using the knockout cells than the wild type cells. This is correspond to a complete reorganization at the epigenome level. And uh, uh, the, particularly these two genes uh, that we have studied in particular are uh, um, more associated in terms of HVK form trimethylation and K27 acetylation for this neurogenic transcription factor and less associate for this mesendodermal genes, suggesting that you have a complete rewiring of the, of the uh, genome in this particular cell. So I'm finishing with this. What is the importance of the transcript in this uh, process? And this is an important point for every link. This is what I've showed you in the beginning with the promotion of the loop. But there's people that think, that, uh, and there reason to think, that uh, you might have also, uh, you know, transcript-independent function of an enhancer. That's not, not disputed. The problem is that how to prove this, because you might have function associated to the transcription, but not to the mature transcript. So the simple act of transcription might promote activation because it changed the epigenome locally. So you can use this by, uh, by I mean, you can probe this by different, different techniques. The one, the deletion one that I just showed you, using the Gapmer or, or associated uh, methods, but also by inserting Collier signals at different uh, positions in the transcript to, to remove the transcript and preserve the DNA element. And obviously you can use the gainer function uh, that I already mentioned. So if you do that with uh, assessing the, the meteor uh, uh, function, looking at undifferentiated cells first, if you use gap mers, you knock down the gene. If you use a premature uh, polyase signals, you downregulate the gene, but you don't have an effect on, on the, the, the coding gene's expression. This is different when you differentiate the cells. Insertion of premature polyase signals completely abolish differentiation. And uh, if you use a CRISPR-on approach now, then you can activate Meteor and induce the cardiogenic organ. So this proved formally that the, the mature transcript is important during differentiation. Okay, this is the summary. Uh, I'm, I'm making it brief because uh, I'm sorry for being late. But, but um, uh, what is important to remember is that uh, this type of transcript control differentiation and commitment in pluripotency because they are solely expressed in pluripotent stem cells. So this is a completely new type of, uh, of uh, locus associating uh, long encoding RNA and an important transcription factor controlling commitment in pluripotent cells. These are the people that did the work. Uh, I'd like to thank particularly Samuel Zane. And uh, Whisper study was performed by Woody Micheletti. Uh, it's here. And the Meteor study was uh, a PhD work by um, Michael Zane. It's here. Both of them are in California now. Thank you very much.